first, uh, when I share at Rady that we invited Tej to present at our uh, executive series, Dr. Shin, he was like, me, me, I want to chat with him. <laughs> so we decided to have this section different for our traditional format where our beloved Dr. Shin, who is Associate Professor of Innovation, Information, Technology, and Operations, as well as the Jimmy and Clisaria Chair for Entrepreneurship. And he will talk a little bit about uh, manufacturing and industry experience. As you all know, or most of his students that are here attending know, he's uh, focused is supply chain and he's very interested in diagnosis. So I cannot wait to hear this conversation and see more about collaborations and partnership. The floor is yours, Dr. Shin. Thank you, Monique. And thank you, Tej, for the fascinating presentation. To me, it's also very, uh, it, it was great to see the, the framework that you mentioned in terms, even in terms of modularity, you mentioned those four factors such as technology, manufacturing, regulation, and customers, right? Uh, those are actually great uh, sort of a framework to think about. And with that, I wanna start a few questions related to those four points. Let's start with the uh, technology and manufacturing both kind of together. And specifically in the last video that you showed, it is, it is awesome to see that you decided to actually have that manufacturing site here in Irvine in California so uh, related to that point, how much of the manufacturing have done in-house, um, specifically the degree of vertical integrations that you try to get, um, or in other words, uh, you know, I'm a supply chain guy. So related to that, what is your decision on make or buy, right? Uh, in particular, sort of a over time, what have you done also over time, even including the future? What do you think about um, in, in having the manufacturing in-house versus outsourcing? Yeah, no, that's a that's a great question. And, you know, it's a it was something that we and again, a lot of these things were sort of lessons learned as we uh, went through the whole development process. And I think especially in this last two years, when we started to scale up to start manufacturing a lot of our COVID tests, that's something that we realized, like, oh, man, how do we really set up ourselves to have a successful supply chain? And like, where do we vertically integrate? Where do we not? Um, I, I think when you look at it, there's a couple of different parts to it. Um, there's more of a, let's say, a mathematical approach to it where we say, okay, hey, what are the components, what are the items that we have multiple suppliers for, where we, we don't have any single sources uh, for supply? That was a really key thing for us to say, okay, we can identify those components where we have multiple suppliers. We don't necessarily need to vertically integrate and bring that kind of manufacturing in-house. But components where that wasn't so much a, a case where we knew, okay, we couldn't have that, uh, that multiple source uh, supply. Then we're like, okay, let's go ahead and integrate one step down. We kind of looked at it as like sub-assemblies, right? So you'll say, okay, you know, for example, you might have one part that has uh, two or three different components in it. And that's a single source, it comes from a single source supplier. We'll say, let's go ahead, vertically integrate. We'll make that component. And then it's subcomponents. As long as those subcomponents have multiple suppliers, and then we're, that's kind of where we stop. But that's, that's more of, again, the, let's say the mathematical clinical approach to it. The other approach was, that we took is what were the suppliers where we made sure we had that relationship? And the relationship is a really important part in the supply chain. Um, and as long as we could have and maintain really strong relationships with suppliers and we knew that we felt we could trust that supplier, that in and of itself was super valuable enough to say, okay, hey, you know what, this is something that we don't necessarily need to fully vertically integrate, or, you know, it's something that we can deal with at a late date because we have that kind of a relationship. Um, that was really important. So when we looked at like how we actually uh, chose to vertically integrate, where we chose to develop, that was, I'd say, um, two major aspects of it. Another part too was uh, sort of just more related to where we felt our core competencies were. For us, manufacturing is one of our core competencies. And that's something that we were like, hey, you know what? We're going to hold on to that. Um, it just comes back to like not only our skill sets that we have at the company, but also just our DNA from even our like funding sources and stuff like that. It really focused on manufacturing. So knowing that we wanted to continue to manufacture 
um, especially our cartridge. It's a really highly integrated microfluidic cartridge. We utilize a lot of uh, technology from the printed circuit board industry. That was something where we said, hey, we're going to probably vertically integrate most of that because that is something that is really important for us at the, at the end of the day. And that's what we've done. And actually what's been pretty great with this whole, when you look at this, all the supply chain issues that have happened over the last <laughs> two years, um, when it comes to our cartridges, I think we've been able to survive that very well. We've actually have, we have a very robust supply chain. There's no issue for us in producing a lot of those um, test kits that we need to. Um, other areas where we run into that issue though, is like, you know, the chips. I think chips, there's always, uh, what do you call it? The, uh, Mm -hmm. Silicon chips, ICs, things like that. There's just been a huge issue with. But again, where we can, where we can try to just get closer and closer to the, the raw materials. That's that's what we try to do when we can't have uh, multiple suppliers. That's actually great to hear. That's also one thing that uh, that is consistent with what I've heard. In even in terms of chip shortages, right? In the auto industry, let's say, I've heard that. Um, Relatively speaking, Tesla suffered less than the traditional auto uh, uh, makers. One reason what uh, the people said is because of the degree of vertical integration, right? In the sense that the other automakers were making a sort of a, a outsourcing most of their specialized chips. Uh, instead, Tesla's case, they kind of you know did a more of the vertical integration so that they were nimble when there is certain kind of shortages. They can still move on to the other raw materials, and as long as they have raw materials, they yeah. sort of made themselves right. So with that though, uh, I wanted to uh, also talk about one thing that we have been through in these two years. Were there any impact of COVID? Uh, probably not only in manufacturing, it could be in customer side as well, right? Um, and, and anything to share uh, about the impact of COVID in your, in your company's case? Yeah, I mean, definitely that was a, a big challenge because um, especially early in the pandemic, and I mean, still now we do have, you know, when you talk about like outbreaks at the facility mm -hmm. and you know, just making sure that you don't have, um, you have to take all the safety precautions, protocols, everything like that. You know, being involved in manufacturing, you can't, we don't have the luxury of working remote, right? So our workers do have to come in. We have people that work in the lab. We have people that work on the manufacturing floor. And, you know, I'm going to knock on wood so I don't, <laughs> don't jinx ourselves. But we've actually been able to, you know, we had a, we took a very aggressive approach early on on how we uh, dealt with, uh, you know, PPE, how we dealt with, like, making sure we had the right procedures, practices, policies in place to mitigate any um, outbreaks. And we haven't had any actual outbreaks within any of our facilities. We definitely had employees that got COVID, but again, as soon as that happens, we're very aggressive in making sure people stay at home. Um, it did impact because of that, like there was definitely impacts where we had times where we slowed down our production. Um, you know, there were days where it's just like, okay, man, we can't produce anything. But um, overall, I'd say we've been able to, you know, there's other people in the industry that I've talked to where they've had to shut down their facilities where they manufacture for like a good two weeks just because it was just such a big outbreak. There's no way to really easily deal with it. So we have luckily, again, knock on wood, we haven't run into those problems, but um, that is a big, it is a big concern, especially in manufacturing because ultimately there's only certain certain job functions which can work remote and a lot, a lot of them just you have to be in when you're producing things in the real world. So that's a, it's a challenge that we have to face. <laughs> Absolutely. And hopefully it'll be, it'll be over soon, hopefully. Yeah. Right? And uh, another question that I had is when, when you mentioned this uh, platform, right? I thought, wow, that, that's really um, audacious, right? In the sense that it, it reminded me of, let's say, Apple in the industry of, let's say, uh, medical labs, right? It has the computers, for example, you will have the equipment for testing as well as the consumables. But then also another interesting side of it is the software side, right? Which is all in Apple's case, let's say all those apps, right? Even in your case, potentially that, that could be another ecosystem, right? So, uh, but then one thing that's special in this industry is this is the, the medical industry, right? So it, it requires tons of regulations from the government side as well. So here, um, I just wanna hear from your big sort of a dreams, right? For the next 10, 20 years about what kind of, let's say, improvement or rather a, a revolution, right? That you can dream, uh, probably leveraging a lot of even the data that potentially you may collect, right? Um, any thoughts about that? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, 
So I, I didn't dive too much into it uh, at the beginning of my presentation, but really health data, ultimately, like we want, let's, let's say my dream, Fluxergy's dream, is really to make that information accessible. When I said gatekeepers, when you really think about it today, there's so many gatekeepers to health data. I can't, if I wanted to just go and know what my potassium levels are in my blood, that's not a simple thing to get. Like I have to go to a doctor, the doctor needs to agree that I'm gonna prescribe that test. And then they'll, you have to go somewhere else to run the test. It, it's a very, very difficult process to get even basic pieces of information. So when you talk about like 10, 15, 20 years in the future, what I really hope that we can accomplish is that we're able to move away from having all of these different barriers to getting our own health information. And again, I'll use the, the example of the annual checkup. I, I can't like, I'm a data person, I'm an engineer by training, right? I'm not a, uh, I'm not a, I'm definitely not a doctor or anything like that, we, though we do have a lot of, a lot of doctors and uh, you know, uh, biologists, microbiologists and whatnot on the team. But like, you can't tell me one piece of information, that one set of data at one time point is going to be able to explain my health status for the next like one or two years, right? It, it doesn't it doesn't add up, especially when you look at today's world where we use, utilize data so much. So it's surprising that we have so little access to this data uh, and our own health information. So what I really want to work towards is how do we remove those barriers to getting that information and start collecting that data and being able to interpret it and make more valuable uh, decisions on our health. I think that's ultimately what we want to work towards. And that's why we're so focused on point of care, so focused on, again, decentralization. And it's funny you mentioned the Apple example. You, you can't actually think about, when you look at diagnostic testing today, it's very similar to the computer industry in the 1970s. Um, you have you know, mainframe computers, supercomputers, you kind of log into there, you do your computing there, but it's all centralized, right? You never had distributed uh, testing. And then you kind of, you start taking steps, right? So from, from mainframes in the 70s, you went to like IBM, like the personal computers, and then you started getting like computers at uh, companies. And that's probably, if you look at diagnostics today, that's where we're at. And you're starting to get some diagnostic testing capability at physician office labs and whatnot. But really the next step is how do you bring that personal computer to at home, right? A community health clinic at home, and eventually it will be the iPhone. Um, and that's our, that's our dream. And you sort of said the software, the way that, just extending this example even further, right? The way that we look at the software is that's really the assays at the end of the day. The apps are the, con the content yep. of this platform is the different assays that you can offer, the different pieces of information that you can get um, and health data that you can collect. So yeah, I mean, I think it's a very apt example. And for sure, like this industry is 100%, it is, it needs to be, and pull a term from Silicon Valley, it needs to be disrupted. But there is, like you mentioned, uh, regulation. That's going to be the key thing. And it rightfully so, right? Like you need, you're dealing with health information, health data. There's like a certain level of scrutiny and quality that you need to be able to maintain. Um, but that's going to be, I think, the biggest challenge. And why I also mentioned like regulation is something you cannot, when you try to develop a point of care diagnostic platform or any diagnostic platform, you obviously cannot, uh, you, you have to think about that from the very beginning. How do you design your systems, your platform and process to deal with that? So you can really have something that can be super valuable. Great, great. So, you know, I, I can't agree more, right? Also, um, I see a lot of my students here in the attendees, they will know that whenever I think about this um, healthcare or the medical industry, um, First of all, my sort of a angle lever goes up, right? What kind of industry is this? <laughs> but at the same time, on the positive side, it has a great, a, a really big room for improvement, right? Yeah. So that I think it will, I will take that as a positive side of it, which hopefully for some time, you know, maybe a few years, maybe, maybe a decade later, we will be there, right? We will be there. Okay, with that, I have more questions to ask, but at the same time, I want to save some time. I already see a few questions on the Q&A for our students to ask. Uh, thank you again, Tetch. And I also, um, I'm looking forward to seeing you next time in person, and yeah. I'll ask tons more questions. <laughs> no, for sure. Great, thank you, Tetch. And back to you, Monique. Thank you, Dr. Shin. And, and I know you have a lot of fans. And, and, and
participants right now. So uh, also, if you want to ask to the audience, if you want to ask any particular questions to Dr. Shin related to our speaker, you're welcome to do that. So Tesh, here's the first question. Um, amazing work. Thanks very much for sharing. How many clients do you have and how many do you think you could have? And a second question would be, has the Therano scandal made your work easier or more difficult? Thank you. Uh, that's a great, great question. So maybe I'll uh, quickly answer the first question. We actually right now work with a number of different uh, groups internationally. So we're uh, primarily focused in our, our sales of the COVID testing. Uh, in Europe, the Middle East, Asia, we work with distributors globally uh, to distribute our product. Um, and then also here in the U.S., we're, we're actually involved in a couple of different uh, industry market verticals. So we do have a couple of different customers here in the U.S., but in different industries outside of human diagnostics, uh, more related to food safety, veterinary, stuff like that. Um, but to your second question, it's uh, more, I think, much more interesting one. Um, the Therano scandal is what it actually highlighted is two things. First of all, this industry, you have there's a, a minimum bar of quality that you need to maintain. And again, why I, I highlight regulation is such a key part. Like you have to, we just have to deal with it, and you have to be able to work around it and work with it, right? It's a, it is part of what it is. It's there for a reason. You know, I'm, there's definitely things that maybe would be great if it could change a little bit, but at the same time, it, it is what it is. So I think Theranos is definitely highlighting. You can't go, you can't like try to skip over it, right? You have to actually take it into account. But more importantly, what it highlighted is this whole thing about health data, making it more accessible. People want that. I, I think that was the biggest thing. You don't, Theranos would not have had this, at least that initial success that it had if people did not want that, if people did not believe in that. And so I think it really, while yes, what ended up happening with Theranos was very like, let's say overall negative for them, obviously negative for the industry. It also highlighted that this is the direction the industry is going to go to. And I think it really, it really showed to everybody that, yes, we need to start doing developments that way. Um, and the, the pandemic actually only strengthened that too, right? When you talk about telemedicine, and there's a whole bunch of other, other parts of it, but it really strengthened the whole concept of moving towards decentralized healthcare. Thank you, Tej. There's another question here says, in-house lab services are a huge revenue stream for existing facilities. Are you aiming to upgrade existing in-house labs or recruit new POC customers? That's also a great question. And I think it's a little bit of both. There's always going to be a need for central labs. I don't ever think you can fully remove central labs. And again, just looking back at the computer example, Yes, we have the revolution of PCs and iPhones and whatnot, but you still have servers. And in fact, actually servers are coming back because everything's going to the cloud. So it's not, uh, it's not that you can completely get rid of central labs. Um, it's all about, and that's where it comes to workflows, uh, helping to augment the different uh, use cases, right? So for central labs, there is a need for certain types of stat testing. Stat testing or like tests where turnaround time is very critical. Um, we do aim to help support in those types of tests, right? Being able to support uh, central labs and making sure that they can offer stat tests or more advanced stat tests. But ultimately we do look at creating new markets and those new markets will come from the other uh, market verticals like uh, at home testing or more community health clinics, the CBS type concepts like that. That's what we, we also look to create new markets there. Great. Actually, Tej, I just want to uh, ask one uh, last question uh, on, on, on behalf of our students, right? Now that you have a decade of experience, right, after graduating 2012, uh, with the decade of your experience, what is the wisdom that you want to tell, uh, let's say, you in the past or to our students and alumni uh, based on your decade of experience? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think what was definitely exciting for, for me over this last 10 years, right, has really been around, you know, never, never giving up. I think being, so again, my background is more on the engineering side. I'm not a, I'm not a, a, a doctor or anything like that, right? 
But what was what was exciting is that I did a lot of my research while I was at UCSD was around microfluidics, fluid dynamics, um, and I wanted to do something related to that. And I was really excited, like when I saw this opportunity here with point of care diagnostics, it was like, hey, let's jump in, let's do this. And that sort of unbridled enthusiasm, it was a little, there was not a little bit, there was a lot of naivety involved, but I didn't let that hold me back to trying to do a lot of what we're doing. And I would just definitely emphasize that for people to not ever give up, like if they, if, even if they think that it's something that they don't maybe fully understand, as long as you're willing to learn and continually learn, I think this is something you probably hear a lot from a ton of different people, but as long as you're willing to continually learn, never give up. You'll be able to figure stuff, figure things out and continue to progress and do things. And I think that's exactly like with Flexergy, we learned a lot about the industry. There is, we definitely had our ups and our downs, made our fair share of mistakes, but that's why today when we look at like, okay, what is it that we created? We can say like, hey, these were the key key parts that allowed us to succeed, right? And I think you only only get that by learning and trying things. That that actually is a music to my ear, right? Which is when students take jobs, um, typically, you know, there are other sort of aspects of uh, important aspects that they need to consider, but. Uh, Exactly like you you said that Tej, the the amount of learning that will come with the job right yeah. that will be a, a great sort of a criteria to which job to take right yeah. I can't agree more uh, with that I'll pass it to Monique. Thank you and I don't see any questions in the I can but I did receive here in my chat <laughs> and it's how do you say how do you see you or your company involved with the Rady School. Yeah, no, that's something that's a great question. So for us, again, as a UCSD alum, you know, I always, uh, I'm always excited to come try to give back where we can at uh, UCSD, but we're always looking for new people. We're a uh, growing team. Uh, we grew a crazy amount in the last two years. Um, you know, we were in, uh, let's say, early to mid 2020, about 30, 40 people, and now we're 100. We're going to grow still more we're looking to go to 150 probably before the end of the year so we have a lot of open positions um and we're looking for for new, new full-time hires interns um but also we're looking for people to potentially collaborate with um collaborations are always a big part of what we do we already have different collaborations with ucsd with uh, uh, other uc schools more on the scientific side but looking to build those collaborations where we can especially with things like i was mentioning our manufacturing our industry 4.0 or manufacturing 4.0 kind of approach, um, working with people to see how we can leverage new and existing or new and exciting concepts uh, to improve our, our processes, our systems, and really keep us on the cutting edge of manufacturing and point of care diagnostics. That's always what we're looking for. So really there's a lot of different opportunities and definitely looking for new hires and interns, but also for other collaboration opportunities to kind of name it. If there's something that's of interest, please, uh, please reach out. I also want to add, I was I was delighted to see Kayla working there at Flux Surge, and I'm looking forward to more of our students working there, and as well as collaboration with you, Tatch, more. Yeah, no, for sure. I'm very excited about that as well. Great. That's great. Um, so I think we're almost on time. So uh, I don't know, Tatch, do you have any last comment uh, that you want to share with our participants? Doctor, uh, I can see also uh dean or donius who also just i don't know if you have any of you have like a a, a last message for our audience today no i just again i wanted to thank you all for inviting me here today i think this was super exciting it's great to speak with dr shin uh definitely looking forward to our continued conversation there and definitely looking forward to continued collaborations and uh yeah future being able to work together with the rate school as well and just thank you for for your words and i I think this shows the importance of not only the technology and biotechnology, but also the, the business and where they interact because the ideas and the things that you've developed can't get anywhere if we don't know operations and supply chain and finances and all those other aspects of the organization. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. I will echo exactly what Tedji said, never stop learning. <laughs> <laughs> Well, 
Tej, thank you so much for taking the time to share your experience with us and for your interest in the Rady School of Management and mostly as a pipeline for, like you said, internship and other management roles at your company as it's growing. And um, you have expressed in the past that Flu Churchy has an interest to connect with our alumni. So I know there's some alumni here and we're happy to continue to partner and share our network with you and with your team. Dr. Shin, thank you so much for always being a fantastic Rady champion, excellent professor and collaborator. Dean Ordonez, Rady students, alumni, faculty, staff, and friends, Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Have a great day, rest of your day.